is a great feeling of joy. And I will say that for me, I think two of the most important things that I carry with me as the leader of this institution are the Trout Lectures and Chris Walker. And both of those are annual events of this community that decenters our long history of German patriotism. Mm. One of my greatest responsibilities here is to lift up and continue the legacy of the LCW Trout, and even as we do that, to recommit this institution to the work of the anti racism And then in the fall, every year when we celebrate Kristallnacht, which marked, I uh, can't quite say the beginning, but at least was a significant event in the Nazi pogrom against the Jews in Germany. That's an area where Lutherans and German Lutherans, like my tradition, have a lot of complicity. And so every year, just as we gather in the spring um, for trout, we gather in the fall with our Jewish neighbors uh, for repentance and for healing. So this is, this is important. It's important for all of us. Now, I've told you a couple things about me. I want to tell you something about the seminary. If you don't know, here at Trinity, we have worship at 10 o'clock in the morning on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays. And we almost always use the scripture readings that in our tradition are assigned for the Sunday that's coming. This Sunday, in traditions that use the Revised Common Lectionary, the Gospel lesson is Matthew's account of Jesus calling the disciples calling first uh, Simon Peter and his brother Andrew, and then calling the brothers James and John, and telling them that he is going to equip them to fish for people. I've heard th three sermons on fishing for people this week, each of which dug into the text and took it in a different direction and a powerful direction. And as I was sitting here last night, it occurred to me that what needs to be said as maybe the final note on that scripture text for this week is thanks be to God that when our Lord Jesus came fishing for disciples in this part of the world, he caught a trout. <laughs> see how things are working in the world around us. 
so that we have something to offer, something to say as we move forward. I want to continue with this idea of uh, preaching as praxis. And I want to <clears throat> use a bit of Nehemiah and also some other scriptures on this morning. But let me start uh, with this. One of the princes of preachers, uh, some of you may have never heard the name of Gardner Calvin Taylor, but certainly is among the greatest preachers that God has ever raised. Uh, I had the privilege of pastoring up in Oberlin, Ohio, and my second week of pastoring there, I look out into the congregation, and Dr. Taylor was sitting back on the back row. Lord, how am I going to preach like the greatest preacher that I know? But I did the best I could, and uh, we spent some time afterwards. And, uh, Dr. Taylor said to me, uh, uh, Pastor Dudley, you are now my pastor. <laughs> and I said, No, don't put that over <laughs> But Dr. Taylor had been uh, licensed to preach and ordain at the church where I was pastor. And so in a very real way, he meant that. And over the years, we spent a lot of time together. I was able to chauffeur him around whenever he was in town and uh, just grew so very fond of not simply the preacher that he was, but the man uh, that he was. And uh, I thought about all that he had preached and all that he had written, and I came across part of what he offered during the 1976 Lyman Beecher lectures at Yale. He offered these words, how we approach our preaching responsibility depends on whether we consider proclamation of the gospel to be a matter of life or death. If we who preach go up into pulpits in order to pass on some interesting observations or to deliver some practical beneficial homilies or to issue some bulletins about the society's latest crisis. That's one thing. If we look upon ourselves as heralds of the great king, heralds minus foolish and immodest cream to the hearts of human beings of that upon which turns the eternal health or fatal sickness of people in their private and corporate lives, then we shall see our work as preachers, as something else again. All right. yeah. His profound words and thoughts for me capture this idea that our preaching has got to matter, it's got to mean something. And it's got to accomplish something at the end of the day because, as I said yesterday, it's not just enough to talk about Jesus, but we have to make sure that we can demonstrate what difference Jesus makes in the lives of people. We have everything that we need, and God's word to us is always yes. And that same word, as decentering as it is, it invites us, it demands a response. That whenever we hear that word proclaimed, something has got to follow. And I wonder as I lean into this last lecture, what will be our response to this great gospel? How will we live this out? Even if we do have prophetic perspective, how will we follow up with lives that make a difference? Jesus said it this way, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And so we, in whom the anointed one abides, carry the same powerful anointing but for what? For us, Jesus is our Redeemer. Jesus is our Restorer. But as representatives, we are called to be both repairers and rebuilders so that the life that we offer would truly make a difference in the communities that we serve. 
I lift up the figure of Nehemiah today because he was a catalyst for the collective rebuilding of what had been broken. Like the concept of kinesis in biology, where the movement of a cell in response to a stimuli allows an organism to move, watch this, from potentiality to actuality. Yeah. Something happens. So does the church, inspired by the word of God, proclaim it. It's called to make the gospel real, in real time, in real context. Gospel recording artist Cord Hawthorne sang it this way. I want to walk it like I talk it. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's right. You don't make a difference yeah. in what we do and how we live. The Nehemiah narrative is well worn territory for what faith looks like in action, especially in the direst of circumstances. Nehemiah says this Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Our Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates burned. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we may no longer suffer disgrace. I told them that the hand of God had been gracious upon me and also the words that the king had spoken to me. Then they said, let us start rebuilding. So they committed themselves to the common good. I've been saying it over and over again, but our communities are crumbling. Yeah. Resources for so many are so scarce. Yeah. Privilege and power continue to exclude the majority of people who walk on the earth. Yeah. And so preachers, what can we offer to this dire circumstance? And please, no more grand public statements of what you're going to do. Right, that's right, that's right. No more sentimental good intentions and thoughtful resolutions that you put in print so yeah. that everybody can clap their hands. Mm. No more unrealistic strategies that have not been birthed from those on the margins. All right now. Right. No more catchy slogans, no more cute tweets. That's right. If we would but reflect on the opposition that we face yeah, yeah. and what hope really demands, the work we do may actually accomplish something. Psychologist and theologian Richard Beck, who I'm great and fond of, first started uh, in Texas of his Bible study in the prison. And he talked about how when he started that Bible story, he had the greatest intentions. He said, what I'm going to do is go into the prisons and I'm going to help them look through what it's like to live in these dark circumstances. I want to be able to give voice to their despair, voice to their grieving. So he went in with his little cute Bible study lesson, started ministering to the men who were incarcerated there. And about midway through the lesson, the men that he was addressing started to grow restless. They started to look really frustrated. And he asked them, what's going on? They responded, we get it. We get it. We know. Prison is really a dark place. We don't need to be reminded of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. What we need is some hope. Oh, hope. hope, not just in word, but hope in what's manifested in the lives of the collective we live. Hope. Now make no mistake, the opposition is great. In fact, goes on and records these words. The word of God always enters the world as a provocation. Some demon is always being confronted, uprooted, unsettled, or exercised. A demon of shame, a demon of hate. Since the word of God is liberating and emancipatory, some power of slavery is being challenged and overcome. And since we actively and idolatrously participate in this enslavement, even cling to it, 
The word of God is experienced as scandal and contradiction. The word of God gains its first hearing as a stone of stumbling, as prophetic interruption, where the old world is crucified to give birth to the new. Hope is necessary as we acknowledge our dire circumstances and the opposition that we face, but we understand that nothing can stand before the word of promise that God has declared before us. And so praxis is about hope. It's about proleptic living that I referenced yesterday. And Nehemiah understood that. Yes, the walls had fallen. Yes, the nation was broke and under occupation. Yes, it seemed like God had gone silent in their exile. But somebody had to say something that was mirrored by the community doing something. Yeah. Friends, this is about working in the dark. It's about getting our hands dirty. It's about laying it all on the line for yes. the sake of Christ. Yes. Yeah. And as we consider that Nehemiah narrative, it's a blueprint for me of some simple but profound insights that I just want to toss out to you. Seven of them I want you to hang on to. One is that Nehemiah understood the value of confirming his birth. You see, if you don't feel something, in the deepest parts of you so that it becomes a burden then anything you do doesn't matter you've got to feel it in the deepest parts of you and God is always as I said last night a divine instigator God's going to stir up some things on the inside of us trouble our waters because God wants us to feel what God feels secondly Nehemiah understood that this is, this is about engaging God's promise upon this foundation of shalom, upon this foundation of this good gospel. There is something about the promise of God that lets us know we're not just hanging on to a thread. We're hanging on to the fullness of what God has always intended to do. Thank you. Thirdly, we stand in the gap, Nehemiah understood. He was a peacemaker. He was one who called people to solidarity. He was one who understood that somebody's got to go into the midst of these margins and help facilitate things happening. Fourthly, and this is important, he leveraged his resources. Would you believe me if I told you that money is not our problem? We got enough money to do anything we want to do. As I listened to the offering being raised last night for trial lectures, I wondered why are we still having this conversation? Yeah, yeah. When, by the way, the ELCA, among many other mainline denominations, is still one of the wealthiest in terms of assets of any other organization on the face of the earth. What is our problem? It ain't money. Yeah. Don't get me started. <laughs> Five, Nehemiah understands that we got to name the opposition. Sambalot and Tobiah stood internally in the way of what God wanted to do through these people, and yet it did not stop them. But they called it out. They named it. And we've got to make sure, no matter how obscure, no matter how covered up and concealed, our issues may be, we've got to call it out. Six, this is also significant. Nehemiah walked the territory. Yes, he did. Boots on the ground. Yes. He didn't solve the problem from afar, but he went and walked around the ruins because he wanted to feel again what was going on. But the last one, number seven, is so important. He mobilized the community because he understood that it was about collective effort. It was about mutuality. Everybody brought something to the party. For our purposes, we understand that Nehemiah lays out a blueprint. And when we think about proclamation, 
I want to submit to you that the process of proclamation is always meant to be praxeological. Mm. All right now. It's meant to result in some real work being done. I'm having a ball teaching this liberation theology course. And I've told the students that liberation theologians insisted that praxis was so critical and that the gospel action that occurred has to arise from the life of the people. That's praxis. Political theorists from the Frankfurt School argued that the fundamental philosophical problems are in reality social problems, abstractly conceived. Mm. Issues of what we do with our lives. We recognize that praxis is to be reflected praxis practice, I'm sorry. That is our theological understanding being constantly shaped by our ongoing action. It's no wonder that all the nice platitudes that we offer are so empty because they're not really rooted in real action wow. as it could first. Praxis is the prophetic in process. Praxis is something that we have to take seriously. Now, let me warn you, because praxis is also participating with God's crushing to bring forth new wine. Yes, it is. You can say that again. Say that again. Go over here. It's the development of new wine skins, wow. not the old wine skins painted in. It's a sifting that releases the chaff and lets the wheat be the viable substance that it is meant to be. It is the pressing of the olives so that the fragrant and flavorful residue can be lifted and produce that oil. New wine, new grain, new oil all indicate that there's been a process where we've gotten a reality check and some things have got to be challenged. All of those things communally that have been holding us back, we've got to say something about it so that we can get to the place, the necessary place of the process of us becoming ourselves. We are what Gerhard Loving calls a contrast society in small places. See, praxis involves ordered lives that we construct together with healthy support, healthy attention, ample money and investment, real ownership, equity, citizenship, productive labor, where everybody can be a part of what's going on. Praxis. Dealing with things as they are, but doing so from a posture of radical hopefulness yeah. because we understand, as I said last night, that God is up to something and God is up to something with us. So, I want to offer a couple of my guiding principles for praxis. Two, I'll give them to you, then I'll unpack them. The first guiding principle for me is that praxis is about what I call sacred adoption. Secondly, it's about an exponential option. I'm a preacher, so I've got to be kind of illiterate. <laughs> sacred adoption, exponential option. Sacred adoption, so both personally and corporately. We are in the business of identity affirmation and character formation. The daughters, the sons, the children of God have adoption in Christ, sure enough. But they're waiting for adoption in real time. Yes. Adoption by flesh and blood in context. They're waiting, dare I say, for baptism. Not the ceremonial baptism. All right now. 
but the radical inclusion of people who long to be connected with something and someone greater than themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Here in sacred adoption is the reality of absolute security and sufficiency because we are in this together. It's communicated to people so that they know that their lives matter and we invite them in. We understand God is more than enough. Jehovah God, our provider, right? Yeah. El Shaddai, the one who gives me nourishment and sustenance. We know that, but now what do we exhibit? as we help live that out so people can know the living, the invisible God through very visible and tangible and meaningful means. We can do that. And we have to do that. I love Paul when he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Said differently, I can endure whatever opposition is standing in my way. Said differently, I can demonstrate a capacity to produce because God is alive on the inside. Yeah. We have to be the people that offer something to this world. It's got to be real. It's got to be practical. I was just mentioning to Pastor Aaron before we got started this project that I've been undertaking with some colleagues here in the city. We're calling it an urban missionary model. In the same way that we support missionaries across the water, what would it look like for us to do the same thing in our urban centers? Yeah. Yeah. I don't expect that every suburban church would know what to do if they even did come to the city. <laughs> but what they can do is stand in solidarity with some folks who do know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. And perhaps learn a thing or two yeah. along the way. That's right. I'm so glad Pastor David Williams is in the house. He's our first urban missionary that we're supporting. What would it look like for folks who didn't have necessarily a church but who needed support because they had the burden of a mission in our cities? Yes, right. We really stand alongside and not just go in and hold a church service. Yes. Let me be clear yes. about that. All right. What we've been cooking up is a holistic model where we include education and housing and entrepreneurship and job training and things that make a real difference in people's lives. Yes. What would it be like to be church in that way? Yes. Yeah. What difference does it make if you just say the name of Jesus and you don't back it up with some things right. that matter realistically in people's That's lives? Right. Amen. The sacred adoption, we claim not only those among whom we serve, but we claim also those who are willing to serve in the hardest places. Sacred adoption is this idea that God's people ought to be free to be in all their fullness. And we can have some hand in that. Cleopas LaRue, great African-American homiletician, lifted up this idea that historically in the black church there have been four themes that have been central to how African-Americans have understood God to be at work and calling us to work alongside God. First is freedom and partiality. To be so radically free that we can do whatever we need to do and to be partial for the sake of those who are on the margins. Right. And to not act like all lives matter because we know they do. But to think differently about those who need our attention the most. Secondly, about love and partisanship. He says that it's about giving ourselves for the sake of the other and being true partners in this effort. It's about personhood and creativity, allowing people to be who they authentically are, and unleashing and releasing the creativity that brings solutions that maybe we didn't have going in. And then survival and liberation is the fourth. There's value of being able to say, I made it, I'm still here. And now I've got to tell the world about it. Yeah. This sacred adoption is about seeing people for who they really are 
and allowing ourselves to be seen for who we really are. Then this exponential option idea is also as critical for me. See, I argue that the church must no longer be about simple action, however well-intentioned. We have to be honest about impact. An exponential option works for kingdom increase. I think I mentioned it yesterday, we can learn a thing or two from the business community that deals in metrics and results. I admit that the church tends to be all about action, but we don't sufficiently pay enough attention to impact. All right. Do we not see in scripture the value of faithfulness that is demonstrated by fruitfulness? We like the faithfulness part. Yeah, God, I'm with you. It ain't produced nothing. There's something wrong with that. The two go ahead. In hand. Now, to be fair, Paul says, I plant Apollos waters, where's God who gives the increase? Yeah, I know that. But with the seed of the gospel, we all play our part. God is the one who defines and gives the growth, but we are the vessels through which that growth happens. It's about disciple making, it's about sacrifice. It's having the greatest impact on our communities by way of investing in people. Investing in relationship. It's about pouring ourselves out for the sake of the other. <clears throat> Over the past seven or so years, I've been uh, pouring out to about a dozen millennial leaders here in our city. Many of them were just getting started when we connected. And today I look back and see how much God has accomplished through those lives. And it makes me smile to know that maybe somewhere along the way I said something that helped facilitate what they're accomplishing today. I was invited a couple months ago to a leader's commissioning services for one of them. He had started a church plant, and within one year, he had gone from a couple dozen people to a few hundred people, but not just people who showed up for worship, activated disciples, active believers. And it was amazing to see at that commissioning service, there were about 300 people in the room. And I ended up commissioning 150 of them. Because they were all leading in their respective efforts in ministry, not inside the walls of the church, but in the city. Amazing impact as exponentially I was seeing lives transformed through but the remnant, through but the seed. That's what it requires. And I need to warn you, God. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground yes, and, yes, and dies, yes, uh, yes. there will be no exponential increase. Yeah. I'll say that differently. God bids us come die. If we really want to see growth, how many of our congregations, I'm going to get in trouble right through that. How many of our denominations are just on life support? Because they really don't believe all this cross stuff. That's right. We talk about it in worship. But to actually come and die. Oh, to give up our preferences? To give up the things that we grow accustomed to and comfortable with? Yes. Do we really believe that God wants to produce something from our lives, albeit through the pressing, through the crushing, through the sifting, through the dying? Uh, is that not the way of Jesus? Well, I think I have some Bible believing folks in here. <laughs> 
the one who was born in the flesh, the one who lived and went around doing miracles, was the same one who hung on a tree. Yes. And they didn't take his life. Years ago, um, uh, and I'll say this: I've been hanging out with these white evangelicals for the past few years. We disagree on so many things, <laughs> but we share a commonality on the gospel. Our meeting, we, I was meeting with white evangelical pastor. His congregation is probably about three thousand, four thousand here in the city. We're at the table, and I said, hey, man, uh, I've got this idea. I want to talk about reparations. <laughs> By the way, there's a new project out now. Eric Alexander from Living Single, Whitney Dow, created a project called The Big Payback, where they've investigated what's been going on with House Bill uh, 40. This 30 year old congressional bill that's been sitting on the sidelines. It's a commission to study slavery and reparations that nobody wants to put forward and actually accomplish. But they've been working on this project. So I said, hey man, I want to talk about reparations. And he knows me. He looked at me and said, I don't know. I said, since y'all white folks don't like that term, reparation, how about if I call it reinvestment? <laughs> and I don't need y'all to just cut a check. What if we set aside scholarship money so that every black and brown kid in Columbus City Schools could go to the vocational school, two-year school, or college and university of their choice? How's that for reinvestment? And the payback would be phenomenal. Because those who would go through would then in turn become productive citizens of our communities, come back and reinvest themselves, and the cycle would have been broken and things can change. So, yeah, so what do you think about that? <laughs> My friend said, I don't like it. Don't know. Okay. But because you said it, I'm willing to work with you. And I'll bring whatever it takes, even though I may not agree with it. Wait. Come, die, lay it down, and let's see what happens. With prophetic perspective, manifested through our crisis, the people of God and the world whom God loves had an opportunity to incarnate the very promise of God. What will we do? Word up. Who oh, no. Thank you.
How do you think the pandemic has changed the nature of preaching? And how do you think preaching will be different? Hope we're still in the pandemic, but post-pandemic culture. What's interesting on the inside? Again, I'll make a confession. I have absolutely no faith in people. <laughs> and I think so many still will have missed it. And have just retreated back to what they've known all before. But though I have no faith in people, I have all the faith in God. And as I said yesterday, I believe God is still going to work through a remnant. Yes. And those who have heard and have seen will be able to respond. And it's being reflected in their preaching. I think the people that weren't saying anything before aren't going to be saying anything now. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, again, I'm going to be pessimist here, but um, unfortunately, things are not going to change for so many people. But I maintain that all God needs is a seed for things to happen. Yes. And so those who do see it, those who will say it, uh, those who will work towards it, it comes out when they're preaching. You and I uh, know as sons of Charles Edward Booth that where there is prophetic preaching happening, the community is mobilized and activated. That's right. And things are happening. And so I would have to be As I said yesterday, God's not without a witness and things are happening. The pandemic, if anything, just uncovered the stuff that was there. And yeah. Answer it is keep proclaiming, keep preaching, and at some level you labor with people where they are, and you trust that the Spirit of God working through your proclaimed word is the same God working through the hearts of those people, and that they will get it at some level. And even if they all don't get it, all we need is a remnant. That's right. I keep coming back to that. The non-politically correct answer is shake the dust. Yeah. 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 And keep it moving. Yeah. This may be the same game, but um, so we talk about increase and impact and being a part and leading a congregation that's surrounded by um, mega churches. So that that is reflected, that that is what the, the increase is, and that we need to go after that. If you have the heart of a preacher who understands that impact is different, and, and we actually are doing the impact and the increase, stay with me. There are some mega churches that are called to be mega, not just in terms of numerical growth, but in terms of impact, and they are really doing it. There are others that are just fat, a whole lot of people with nothing really going on. I think there are both types uh, happening right now. And so I don't want to broad brush yeah, uh, the mega church movement, uh, and that, that's not also to diminish where the hearts of the people are, because even within those that are just fat and not impactful, there's a remnant yeah. that's, that's active in doing some things. So um, I'd rather think in terms of the body of Christ, which for me, and for our Columbus context, not in any way, is about churches of all sizes and all geographic areas and all denominations, somehow we represent the Church of Columbus and we've got to find ways to collaborate and work together. And uh, that's really what I've been doing 
my life for the past 10 years. So uh, it's mega church working with my friend down the main street for 12 members mm-hmm. and accomplishing some great things. That can happen if we allow it to happen. So we're all in this together. Thank you. Yeah. That's totally. narrating that story for their community, right? And so I'm looking specifically at how to tell the story where new growth is happening. Now, we've been talking a lot about communities, and, and there, there are certain things that are very practical where you can see things are working, where you see meaningful things coming up. But part of what happens in that process is, is that formation uh, that is happening inside of people, uh, in your church and in the community, that's not always easy to see when you're going through that process. And it's such an important thing. And at the same time, uh, you know, our actions that don't have impact also. So how do you how can you tell the story when you want to celebrate what's happening in the community and you also want to recognize that that folks are dealing with their stuff, they're becoming disciples of Jesus, and some of that's just not going to show on the outside for a while. How do you tell that story? You said that well, Tori. Thank you for that. And I confess that I have a unique vantage point. Because I've worked with dozens of leaders and congregations around the city. And so as I'm collecting these stories, I'm able to articulate. But part of what happens is we become so insulated and isolated, separated. We don't cross over boundaries, and so we don't know what God is doing. Sometimes right next door to us. And so one of the answers is um, back to that idea of coming together in collaboration. So share our mutual stories and we can hear what God is doing on the other side of town. Leaders can facilitate those interactions and those connections. And I ain't talking about having a king service once a year. I'm talking about something more substantive where we actually engage and develop a relationship and there's mutuality there. That's one of the best ways to experience the lived story of people. And it, it tends to also spark ideas in people's minds and generate some things for people so that even if it wasn't happening where I am, now that I've seen something different, I can bring that back. It's a level of exposure that happens. So the real engagement between people who are different and located in different places, but also through, as you said, our, our own preaching to be able to lift up what God is doing and how God is working. And we never know the impact internally that's going on with people when we are able to expose them to different things like that. So for me, I think that's that's one of the ways that we do that. Sister Jen, you were gonna. Um, I, just an observation, I've been so aware of the impact of contemplation we need to take that time to see before we can proclaim. We need to take the time to see what needs to die in us before we can impact the lives of others. And so just it's been a thread that I've heard throughout your Absolutely. Class. And I would, would amend or augment that to say that, that yes, you know, it's guys like me, you know, I spend two hours with God every morning at 4.30 a.m., no matter how busy I am. But that's my sacrifice, and it helps me. But even then, it's not enough. So it's laboring and walking with people alongside me that can point out the areas that are my right interests and things that need to change. And now all of a sudden, we have a community that's walking together, and we're all being shaped and transformed by our interaction with each other. Not just my personal time with God, but our collective time, communal time with God, our walking together that makes a difference as well. Yes, I do. Uh, good, good. Your idea of uh, reinvestment, dealing with semantics, reinvestment in the place for reparations, plus reparations, 
Great question, and uh, again, I, I get in trouble quite often. Um, as I said, money is not the problem. We got money. It's just a question of what you prioritize with that money. I was critiquing another friend of mine who uh, they just invested $22 million in building a new church. And I said, man, you could have funded entire project that changes people's lives yeah. and we're more concerned with constructing this facility. You know, we need places to worship, but <sighs> really? So I think it's it's helping to challenge in relationship, in authentic relationship, ways that we fail to see even what we're doing to call attention to that. It, it releases resources that are there that were just directed to things that in the grand scheme of God's economy don't matter mm. at all. Mm. So can we be honest about that? <clears throat> we think about um, the uh, 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 endowments of many congregations, especially in like the Lutheran Church, <laughs> that are set aside for building set aside by people that love, left um, these large sums of money just to perpetuate the congregation that's dying anyway. Yeah. What are we doing with that? Right? So we, the resources are there. It's just calling ourselves into account and what we prioritize and what we do with those resources. So, yeah, again, money's not our problem. Uh, wow, thank you, Reverend Dr. Dudley. I'm going to say you just set up exactly where the Holy Spirit led me to speak at this moment. And the Holy Spirit's been working on me since yesterday when my husband, Pastor Daryl, talked to you about the offering. Um, but but I, I'm going to, I, I'm going to speak to the white folks in the room. And I'm sorry um, if that excludes the rest of you. But I would, I would say that I, and often in places where people say we are the whitest denomination, and that's statistics, that's not opinion, um, and they say, what can we do? How can we support the African-American Lutheran world, people, individuals, congregations, whatever? I hear a lot of people say that. I do. I'm in a lot of different conversations where people say, what can we do? And I find myself here thinking about things like how can we um, how can we look toward the common good? How can we look toward reinvestment, toward committing some of those dollars in other places? And I put a challenge out that if you are a part of a congregation that has an endowment of some sort that has funds that could be available for things like this, um, they're not usually just going to write a check. They're usually going to make you fill out some kind of form. Don't just send those forms to Dean Klein Hands expecting her to take care of all of that. Like, take it on for yourself. Say, this is an important thing. I, I don't, I'm, not a, I'm not involved in the money side of the Trout Lectures. I've just been a, a witness and present for many of them. Um, so I don't know the dollars that are needed to make it self-sustaining, as was identified yesterday, but I'm going to tell you, I just know there are congregations around that have dollars, and not that they're looking around going, gosh, I don't know how to spend them, but they are often asking questions, where can we invest dollars to support other parts of the church that we're not as aware of and we're not as involved with. So I just 
I don't know, the Spirit put it on my heart. I brought it to you, and I ask for you all to, to dwell with that and to see where you go with it. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sister Powell. And I want to accent what you just said. I'm, I'm looking at a couple of my uh, brown sisters in the room that are part of the Lutheran Church for longer than I am. And it makes no sense to me that they have to struggle to figure out. Amen. 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 I don't care what the system is set up, the things that we're supposed to do appropriately and all whatever. Amen. We have money. Amen. Let's help these who are serving in hard places Amen. actually live. Yeah. So that's something we can do yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah. But we're not, which tells me we don't want to. Yeah. 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 That's unfortunate. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, what is the relationship between preaching and teaching? Mm. I've noticed over the years many pastors, uh, while being great preachers, many, uh, do not offer much at the classroom table in their congregation. Mm. What's the link in your mind? My bias is that there is a place for in depth discipling walking with people through material that you just can't get through in one setting. So my idea of, of teaching is more about equipping and maturing and helping people to grow. My idea of preaching is somewhat different. It's people who come into a context and they don't get a word from the Lord. They don't know how they're going to read it. That's not the time to drop a bunch of information so that somebody can learn. That's the chance to inspire and comfort and challenge and help. So for me, my bias, that would be the difference. And I don't know if it's ever said in exactly a, a clear-cut way, but um, both of those elements kind of go into everything that I do as teacher and preacher. All right, one more. Professor Brandon. Jesus, right? There were yes. times when he offered the word that was for the people that were gathering, but then he was walking around with some dusty brothers at the other time, you know, helping them just to understand what it means. It requires both, and you're right, both are proclamations, same word, same spirit. Um, it just manifests in different ways. Yeah. Teaching, preaching. Everything we do as congregations. Everything we do, how we treat people, the Lord, the Word, we go to work afterwards. Everything we do is teaches and learns in the faith. So, the dinner I am, absolutely. The position of the Bible, absolutely. But right now, the way you are being in community, the way you are sharing ideas, teaches and learns the life of the, of the faithful. So, it's the life of Jesus, not just the official teachings. It's the living. Thank you. Thank you. Well, listen, thank you all for tolerating me for the last couple of days. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
yesterday. My name is Pastor Mary Ann Sipke, and I am privileged to serve as your Director of Congregational Engagement and Advancement. And my favorite thing to do is tell stories. And one of the things I do is tell the story of Trinity, which includes you. And I also love hearing stories. So friends, I want you to share with us a story that you have about Dr. Trout, about Dr. Featherstone, maybe even about Dr. Dokey. <laughs> that is how we grow in community, is to share our stories. All right, friends, so who's going first? <gasps> Pastor Rinda. I became Lutheran in Los Angeles and my pastor is Alvin Starr. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the members of the congregation was Nelson uh -huh. Trout. And I was on a spiritual whatever. I don't know what God was doing, but I woke up in the middle of the night, and when I got through, I had written a whole worship service called Love Harvest mm -hmm. Sunday. And um, I brought all that stuff to Albert, and I said, what do you think? He said, okay, cool. It's people. I said, for real? He said, yeah. So, and I was about the preacher, and um, he said, you preach it. You can't, God gave it to you. You preach it. I had never preached. I, I, I was an actress, you know. I, I stood in front of people, uh, overcame a, a speech impediment, stammering. So, I mean, but out there I was. And so after it was, I, the worship service was over, it was, it was uh, blew my mind, and I went up to Dr. Trout, and I said, um, so um, how did I do? He said, don't give him too much, leave him something to grasp. <laughs> <laughs> All right, friends. I have a fantastic story about Dr. Trout, um, but uh, I feel like my husband had that firsthand experience more. But what I will, what I will um, commit as a witness here is how much Nelson and Jenny Trout loved and supported one another mm. through everything. Um, the most beautiful moments that I experienced the two of them, they would be at a like a pre, like a pastor's conference or a professional leaders gathering or whatever, two of them holding hands, walking along, um, and they just held each other up in um, in the most beautiful of ways. So um, again, maybe not the professional side of Pastor Trout, but definitely um, the the human and beloved husband and wife. Dr. Trout was my anchor. Mm -hmm. 
Um, he guided me through rough waters. And when he was elected bishop, he said to me, daughter, I want you to come into the Lutheran church. He said, I'm leaving you in the hands of Jim Childs. <laughs> I won't be here, but I'm leaving you in the hands of Jim Childs, and I know that he will get you over the low line. And so I started my Lutheran adventure. But I think that Nelson Trout gave courage mm -hmm. to so many African American yes. leaders. He started a program where you could get a bachelor of theology degree here because there were pastors who had not been formally trained. And so he advocated. And at one time, this place was significant in its diversity. I would like to challenge you once again to become significant in your diversity. Wow. 
Father, I want to make it very clear that I'm just a poor, humble parish priest retired. But back in the day, uh, in LA, where I was a lay associate and I was preaching uh, every Sunday. So coming to Trinity, my reputation preceded me. And as a junior, uh, my I group, and I groups back then, they also had I groups. Well, they wanted me to preach in chapel, but not just in chapel, but in chapel on Wednesday, yeah. when only seniors and professors preach. So there was a big controversy going around the campus that this junior was going to be preaching. Well, Dr. Trout uh, helped me with that and told me, don't be afraid because there's so much controversy going on. When you go in there, you just focus and preach with power. The day of the service, on that Wednesday, there was standing room only in that chapel to see what this junior from L.A. was going to do. When I got through with the sermon, Dr. Trout came to me and he said to me very clearly, you created your own context. And from that moment on, I knew that if I just preach unapologetically with power, yeah. the Holy Spirit would do the rest. Amen. He was my mentor, my professor, he preached my ordination and ordained me. And he was sort of like uh, the father of all the uh, African descent students as well as the African students. And we would meet across the street in the family house and have a barbecue and have a talk. Uh, we were family in that way, and he would mentor all of us. So we are all grateful for that, and we all stand on his theological strong shoulders. Uh, as uh, proclamation uh, preachers of the gospel. Thanks to Dr. Trump. Again, he taught us all how to do it with power.
But I started right during the pandemic, just like God. So I didn't even learn about trial lectures my first uh, year. I didn't learn until 2021 when Bishop Bill Curry came and he was ready to hoop. And I was like, oh, y'all can do it. We still just wait on that B3 camera order right there. <laughs> um, but definitely grateful for Bishop uh, Trout, but also learning the Black Lutheran history, something that is close to my heart. Serena and I, here we've had these talks about why isn't the seminary in the academy? My wonderful professor, Rector, one of your giants, Dr. Richard N. Stewart, just passed away. Pray for his wife. Hopefully, if y'all know her, please go and check on her. But he has all the research for um, Bishop Trout, Featherstone, all of the other Lutherans um, that I've been learning about. So just want to encourage Academy to include that because when we come here as a black student, we are looking for a sense of belonging, especially when we're coming from another denomination. It took me a while, it felt like we were playing catch up because we didn't know the Lutheran background. But once we learn it, even my sister, who's a pastor here, right in Columbus, Ohio, across from East High, please go to East High. That's another thing, the class diversity. I'm from the other side of the tracks. So God has a purpose for all of us who are coming from lower class. So extend your hand, walk East High needs help, Champion Middle School needs yes. help, go that way, Whitehall, yes. go down Long Street. There's all of these K through 12 who needs to know about Bishop Trout. And so that's my call to action to the pastors. Uh, make sure your leadership team is including the young people, even down to iGen, because now I'm in the Westernville City District, in the middle and upper class, they are engaging their young people at 10 and 11. These young people are ready to go and I've seen the time delay in our church. Some of them are ready to preach. I've got young people coming to me. Can God use you? Yes, King Josiah was eight years old. So some young people need to be up in pulpit. We need to find a way, being my hands, Holy Spirit, this is Pentecostal. Where is our training for K through five? Six through eight. High school, bachelor's, the whole full cycle top, uh, pipeline. Let me pack some mic, because then I'm about to preach and I'm just supposed to get my yes. together. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand the audience. I, well, I won't say audience, I'll say assembly. Is Pastor Drew Tucker with us this morning? No, he's not. 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 Okay, somebody gets to eat his chicken soup. No, just your, your comment, Marcella, about young people. Uh, Pastor, Pastor Drew has just submitted a great proposal to an endowment for, I forget if it's a million and a quarter or a million and a half, but it's for an initiative specifically geared toward faith formation and involvement of children and young people in That's worship. Well, we do it. And is it's, it's probably not something we could have done as an independent seminary, but as a seminary that's part of Catholic University that also has an education department, has a human psychology department, we don't have developmental psychology. There are all kinds of resources that we have access to now that let us do a more holistic approach to things like this. So uh, from time to time, face Indianapolis and pray that the nice people at Lil Endowment will decide that this is a proposal to come. And we should find out sometime this summer. Thank you, my friends. I asked for the opportunity to make one last comment about uh, Dr. Nelson. Dr. When I said yes to God, God didn't say yes to me to go to a Lutheran seminary. He said go to Laura Roberts University. And so I went up to Dr. Nelson Trout after church one Sunday and told him, I said, this is what I seem to be feeling like I'm supposed to do and whatever. And I said, do you think the Lutheran church will have me if I go to Oral Roberts University? And he said, if the Lutheran church rejected you because you went to Oral Roberts University, the Lutheran church needs to be abolished. 
So I will move to Tulsa. <laughs> pray for pray for. I've been asked to pray before we go to lunch. Merciful and loving God. Meal times were very important in the days of Jesus. It was where they shared intimacy. And we are walking in the footsteps of those that are from centuries apart, but Lord God, we are sharing intimacy when we share our love for you and serving you that is so deeply intimate to our hearts. And we want to give thanksgiving to Dr. Kevin Dudley today, for, to God for Kevin Dudley today, because he's helped us. We thank you for the time to have conversation today, Lord, and to hear each other, and to remember and to rejoice. And so all these things we take with us to this meal, this gathering of, of people sharing, talking, and eating, and loving, and hearing, and appreciating. We thank you for the food that has been prepared. We thank you for the hands that prepared. We thank you for the safety of the hands that prepared. And we thank you for your fellowship of the heart that you've given us that we can share together. We bless each other. We thank you, God, for each other. And this meal we're going to share. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we 